right, hello and welcome everyone to this sweet presentation we're gonna do about how to stop wasting time on marketing your course or your training-based membership site. I've got Tom Leibelt here. He's an excellent marketer, sales professional, and uh, he does, he takes it very seriously and he does it by the numbers. In order to do the numbers, we have to have proper marketing attribution in place um, he's from wetrackyourmarketing.com. Tom, I'm so excited to have you back here. Welcome. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm always uh, happy to be on. Like, I, I follow your stuff too, man. Like, uh, the thing that I love about what you do is the consistency and you're persistent. You know, it, it's not usual in the online space. And I, I think play, that's... I, I play the long game. That's, I mean, that's once I get on the, something, I'm going to be on it. <laughs> so it's, uh, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, because I, um, I just don't see it often. Um, and I think that's, that's great. That's why I reached out back to you. I was like, you know, I, I want to make sure your audience um, understands kind of what we go through in our agency, like on, on a daily basis. They, you know, so I'm going to share some strategy and just how, why we do what we do. I think it's going to help. Um, that's awesome. Main, well, well, before we get into it, just uh, real quick to housekeeping for the group. Um, this is interactive. We are going to do Q&A. So use the Q&A box, use the chat. Um, if you have questions as, as you go, do you prefer, Tom, to have questions throughout or save to the end? Um, usually at the end, it's best because I, once I get off my game, I'll yep. like, where was I? I'm completely not remembering. <laughs> <laughs> I can to totally relate. So we'll save questions at the end, but as he's talking and questions come up, uh, drop them in the chat. If you're watching this on the live stream in the Facebook group, we'll be keeping an eye uh, on the comments over there and I'll help MC those in at the end. We're also gonna be doing a Lifter LMS giveaway of $99. So if you stay to the end and you're live on the call, you'll be eligible for that. You can use that on a free year of any of our uh, single add-ons priced at 99, or you could apply it against something else. If you're already a customer, we'll hook you up uh, with that value of that and extend your license. And that's really all the housekeeping. I'm super excited to get into this with you, Tom. Marketing is part art. It's part science. It's really both of them working together. So take us to school. Yeah. So, you know, I used to always say that too, that we're like part science and part art, but uh, I read this book very recently, right? It's um, the bean counters versus something else. It's, it's like a, out of uh, the GMC um, car company book, right? And how the um, scientific and MBAs and bean counters destroyed the entire company <laughs> by being themselves. So, I'm, I'm a little more careful now <laughs> when it comes to that. I think more about systems and, and just, does this make sense? You know, yeah. I, I try not to say the science thing because, you know, if you go too much in the scientific, oh, give me the 15 proven headlines and give me the 15 that you're going to come out with something super bland and destroy what you're doing. And um, I wish I knew the full title of the book, but if you just put bean counters in like Amazon, you'll find it's an amazing book and I was just you know I looked at it I was like my god I'm making a lot of these mistakes by going too scientific so <laughs> I think that's just wanted to share that that's awesome so this is um a little bit of housekeeping on my end I'll keep it super short um been in sales and marketing for too long I've owned my businesses and brick and mortar businesses so I've seen both sides um and I know which one I prefer um, at the moment, I'm running a course marketing agency, which means what I'm saying is very um, important to this group, right? Because if I do just a marketing agency, people will be like, well, what's this got to do with courses? I'm, I'm, I'm in your niche. Like, I know right. what you're going through day to day because we an SEO agency, been doing it for a long time. Over 150 course creators marketing their courses, responsible for a lot of money in the last 12 months for them. Um, you can find more info about me, but um, yeah, let's get on with the show. Um, oh yeah, this is uh, something I was showing at the presentation the other, uh, the other month and just people <laughs> laughing so hard. But uh, <laughs> that <was> good. <laughs> I, I like to send stuff like this to my, to my email list too. So just throwing that in there. It's awesome. So Here's the strategy, strategy and tactics that we work when we um, start playing with paid ads. And this 
presentation works for all marketing, right? Organic as well. The reason I put paid ads in here because that's the most risky thing that you can start, right? You know, if they're like, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really cost me anything. It does, but it doesn't hit your wallet immediately. So that's why I touched on paid ads. Anytime my client starts paying out their pocket, that's when things get real, you know, because it's, yeah. it's a daily, you know, how much do we spend? Yeah. So this is what we usually do. Um, every single client that comes across, we start tracking marketing because 99% of them just don't do it. The second thing we do, we start playing with paid ads um, is we need to find the message that converts. And this is usually when we do try to touch on the organic as much as possible. The third thing is we rack the shotgun and I'll explain that. And then we narrow in and scale, right? But this is the strategy you use. So you could say this is as scientific as we get because there are so many variables in each one of these, but this we follow every single time. So we're tracking marketing. Um, we used to track just you know, and, and Facebook and all of them. But we quickly realized, and, and this happened um, during the bigger job, small numbers, like you usually don't notice it, but when you start making, you know, 40, 50,000 dollars a month uh, through courses and spending, you know, 15, 20,000, these numbers showed up very, very clearly. And all of the conversion numbers we've seen from Google and Facebook were off, right? Because we tracked them initially through just Google Docs. So we knew what's in the bank. And then we looked at the Google numbers and Facebook and they were always off. And 30% is a huge number um, when it comes to, you know, when you're spending serious money and looking for, yeah. So the 30% was either up or down. Um, we either thought we had 30% more sales or 30% less sales. And later on, we realized it's the same thing with um, just how many people visited our page, still off. Um, Google Analytics, um, does not help much because they don't jump cross platform. And anytime you're doing courses, um, and you will do them for longer, you will start playing with different marketing methods, right? So for example, you will use, um, lift LMS as your course platform. You might use uh, webinar jam as your webinar platform. You might use LinkedIn as your outreach you might use WordPress by itself on a different page is just a sales page. You know, you might use different platforms and Google analytics just does a very poor job figuring out what's happening. And especially when you put emails in that, right? So let's say someone signs up on your opt-in page, they go to email one, which is a thank you, then email two, which is a welcome. And then they go, they go through a sales sequence. Google analytics doesn't know that if someone jumped from the opt-in page to the emails to email eight, clicked on the link, and then bought that this person started off at that opt-in page, as opposed to someone that just opted in through, let's say, a Facebook ad, right? So we just don't know what's happening at all. We sort of know that they came from an email if we have okay tracking, but we just don't know, well, how did they get to that email? How do we get them on the list? We just can't work backwards as well. So it's okay um, for very, very simple tracking in the beginning, but it just quickly uh, loses, you know, it's, it's abilities as you increase the, the marketing and you should really know how people interact, right? Like I like to reverse engineer um, sales as much as possible. So I don't care about the traffic coming in and see where those people came from, right? Cause that's what I want more of. And we can't really do that well with analytics. So um, this is just some um, um, stuff I looked up really quickly on, on Google and you know, articles like this everywhere. They're inflating traffic metrics, they're inflating video metrics. Um, the Facebook one was actually very scary when we went heavy into Facebook videos last year with a few clients and we realized that they're inflating them by almost 900%, you know, the views. Um, for my clients, it was one thing, but I mean, if, if I think about companies like Pepsi or, you know, Coke or, or anyone that's really going heavily in branding, 
and they spent, you know, 20, 30 million dollars with them, thought they're getting all these millions of views and it's really not. Oh man, I, I feel like some lawsuits should be, you know, happening. But anyways, you just, you can't trust what these guys are saying. That's the thing, right? So, and this is why we've seen that trend now going to YouTube more. I don't know if you've seen it, Chris, um, with, the, with the YouTube videos. After, you know, people realize that Facebook is inflating these numbers and they're not working well, then YouTube started becoming huge, which in its own end, I've seen for, so I don't know what kind of courses, you know, people have in this call, but I've seen for anything that's got to do um, with certificates or, you know, passing exams, um, people making six figures before they even come to me um, just through organic YouTube videos. I've just seen it work well every single time but it's for those niches. Like if you are teaching someone how to pass a certain exam and that exam actually leads to something, right? So those ones, I would start with YouTube regardless. And this is how I track my page, right? So it's, it's actually fairly simple. Um, I couldn't really show too much of my client stuff. I'll show parts of it later on, but this is just my thing. It's very visual, right? So I will see you know, how many people hit my homepage, the percentage that moves on to other key pages that I'm tracking. Um, this is one of our very important pages. It's a sales page for we market online courses. So I really wanna see, you know, which case studies are leading into that. I can see that this second one does not do very well. So I'll look into that more. And then I wanna see how many people fill out the consultation form, but it's very visual, right? And you can do this through, um, like I said, inter-platform, right? So this could be your sales page or opt-in webinar. We could move on to emails here. You know, I don't have any in this example, but it's very visual the way we like to track them. And it's easy for clients to see what's happening too. The one part I really like, and it's helpful for people, right? So as I mentioned, my services page, that's my key page, right? So for you guys, it would be your sales page of your course. If you look at the plus symbols, these are all the sources which are being tracked, but I don't have in my map. So I could simply press plus on one of these and have it show up here and be like, okay, now I have an even better um, visual. So for example, I have a couple of pieces of key content in here that's not showed up and my podcast page, that's pretty big. And now I can see too, just by looking at the second one, that my about page is actually bringing in quite a few people onto my services page. So I would probably link those together too, just to get a better number um, and then just visual metric when I look at it. But that's what's cool about this. Like it, it will track things which you are not tracking. It'll still see that traffic. So for some, um, some of my uh, clients, what they've done is they, you know, got affiliates and then things like that. And when they see sales, it'll say, let's say like uh, 200 sales um, and only 15, we can figure out where they came from. And by looking here, we'll say like, oh man, this is where all these other ones are coming from. And usually it's affiliate channels or something else. Um, but at least you have a really good idea now what's happening. Because before we were just like, well, I think I'm getting it from there. You know, and if you have a lot of places bringing sales, it becomes overwhelming. And I've seen this over and over. And this is that reverse engineering of sales, right? So if you've seen my traffic before, and this is from the same time frame, right? Um, so look at the numbers. You have 101 um, on the homepage here, right? So these are the people that directly um, has something to do with my end goal, which is the consultation form. If you look before without reverse engineering, it's a much different number, right? I'm seeing 1500 people that showed up here and these numbers are all off. Um, but they don't all count, at least for me, because they haven't all hit the goal, which I want them to. So I reverse engineer and now I'm looking, okay, let me see where they're really coming from. So see from the about page, yeah, people do click over, but they don't lead to the consultation form as much. Most of them come straight from services and then I would have to click on services here and figure out where are they coming from, right? So maybe they are coming from the about page onto services and I should make this even clearer you know, to, to push them through. So I'd be looking at click-through rates a little more on this page, how to get them into services even more. Um, but I like to see these numbers because these are the people who actually went through and probably bought something from me. 
another thing we do is we look at the heat maps, right? So if, when I mentioned the uh, um, about page, I would definitely set up a heat map on here um, and see how people are interacting. And these two examples are pretty clear, right? Like this one, we would just see where people are clicking. Yeah, pretty much on the button, that's fine. Here, where people fall off in the content, this actually looks pretty good. But I've seen some really weird stuff happen with heat maps. So sometimes towards the top, we'll see a big blue line over here. Um, and that means one paragraph is just horrible and losing people. So easy fix, change the paragraph. Um, with the clicks, what we've sometimes seen, um, a part of the page that means nothing is getting clicked on a lot, you know, because the way people interact doesn't always make sense, which is okay. That's why we track. Um, and we would just put an opt-in or a button in that area and conversions go up because for some reason they're just clicking there anyways. And sometimes it's like a piece of um, text or just like a blank background piece. And we're like, okay, yeah, but you know, we'll have like 13% of all people clicking and we just put something there. So you do want to track this too. And then heat maps is an easy fix. Um, Hotjar.com. Uh, you get three pages for free. Um, easy to get started. So these are the tools we use. Um, heat maps, key pages, hot jar, free. Initially, after three pages, you pay. But you know, you can start with three. Just have your sales page, um, your opt-in page, and one of your key pieces of content or about page with this, because uh, that's where you people click on. And that's 80-20 of that, you know, takes care of most of the business. For that sales conversation, we use Funnelytics, um, which is not free. It's about $2,000 per year now. Um, between that's like 15 to 2,000, depending which one you get. But with our service, you just get access to that for a one-time, very cheap fee. But we use this for all our clients. We were one of the founding members, so we're able to pass this on. Um, but we use Funnelytics for that. It's, it's been working best out of all the ones we've tried. So finding your message. Whenever possible, you wanna use your um, organic audience to do this, right? So before you go paid, before you start really thinking about scaling marketing or even marketing, you gotta figure out what converts for you. So yeah, let me ask Chris about this. Like, do you have a message that you found converts better than anything else when you're trying to sell Lyft or LMS? Uh, well, I know that the three goals that people want are impact, income, and freedom. And so that's a, that's like a benefit that people want. And, um, I know that people want, um, there's some confusion in the marketplace around the difference between an online course and membership site and the LMS. So I need to help right. in, in the messaging for people to clarify what these words mean. Um, and I know depending upon the use cases, whether it's a um, like a uh, online course, a membership site, an internal training tool, an education based marketing tool, the message has to change based on my use cases. So there's, there's a lot of messaging stuff I have to figure out and there's a lot of segmentation going on. Okay. So what we would usually do, um like with you, and this happens with a lot of course creators, we would, we would start with, let's say your Facebook group, right? And we would split test a lot of the messages to figure out which one is getting the most of what you want, right? And then really try to narrow that in while tracking, you know, because you want to track like, you know, these, these links coming through um, properly uh, to just see what message converts best, right? Because that's usually where, um, you'll get the best ideas for your you know, later marketing, but you start with the biggest channel that you have. And I think your biggest organic one would be the Facebook group. Or a podcast, one of those. Or a podcast, yeah. yeah. So you would test those. Podcasts would be a little more difficult since we don't know um, how they're coming off of it. But what I would do is set up um, separate landing pages for each message. Oh, nice, yeah. Um, and then I would know they only heard from this on the podcast because I haven't shared it anywhere else. Um, so by seeing how many hit and what they do based on that, um, I would know what my message is. So if you have a podcast for any course creator, that would be one way of doing that. 
Um, but you know, the main thing is just start with your main um, audience. And for some people, that's an email list. You know, they get it from just doing live presentations. And it's the same thing. You would segment your email list by 100, 200 people, you know, just to get a small, you know, kind of data feedback on you have a lot of people. Um, and just send different messages to different pages. And, you know, based on those links, you can see what people react to better than, you know, not because you, that's, that's the first thing you need. And that's why copywriting is very important. Um, but hiring copywriters is very dangerous. <laughs> why do you say that? Uh, I agree with just, you. I'm just curious what you, what you're saying. So there are a couple of different things, right? Like the, the one is, um, egos right? They usually don't know your market as well as you do, right? So most of them will start telling you about all the stuff they know instead of really asking you about what you know, which is what's going to lead to that copy, right? Um, pricing, you know, it's virtually impossible to, to see um, how good a copywriter is based on pricing. Very little correlation. It's more about how confident they are that they can get that price <laughs> more right. than anything else. Yeah. Um, also, for a lot of course creators that I've seen, um, spending a lot of money here is just not good use of, of the limited budgets that they have. You know, so like there are so many unknowns that by putting money into it, I feel like this is really a lottery. You know, it's, it's, it's just, there's just so many things with copywriters and I, and I've hired some myself too. And like, I have maybe a bit more experience so I can quickly figure out which ones, you know, trying to weasel into the job more than actually know what they're doing. But I found by, you know, asking the right questions of yourself and then of your clients, you can get way more information um, that will create a great sales page than, you know, this copywriter could do. Um, so like my advice would be if possible, and I, I do this for my own business, but you know, if possible for your own, try to sell one-on-one -on -one to a few people. And I don't care how that is. It's through a phone, it's through LinkedIn, um, Facebook messenger, just, you know, talk to a couple clients and really figure out, you know, if there's a common, um, conversation happening. So what that means is, are you hitting the same points every single time um, that lead to a sale? And are you getting similar questions that are stopping people from a sale? And do people see any red flags? And this is a little harder, but you can see that um, by seeing where the conversation kind of stopped, you know, and based on those three things, and this is what any copywriter do. They will just charge you a lot more because they need to research and they don't know your industry. But based on those things, you can actually write a very good sales page, which doesn't need to be long. You know, don't, don't get caught up into these like long form, short form. It doesn't matter if you hit the right points with the, with the prospect um, and they have a feeling like uh, they want to buy from you because the feeling is very important, but logically, they don't see any red flags and, and, you know, this will make sense for their business. That's all you need, right? You just need to hit on those few points. Um, you know, and, and social proof reputation will always help. That's why people have as seen on CNN, blah, 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 as you know, used by these 15 companies as heard on these 200 podcasts, right? That's just a social proof, um, reputation thing, which, you know, a lot of people that don't know you, if you started creating a course, you know, they're like, that's the big, challenge to how do I make them trust me? So those are just small trust indicators. Um, but the sales page itself is just a sales conversation. You know, you got to hit on the same points and um, it's easiest to see that by doing it in, in you know, one-on-one -on -one context, right? And at the end, and this is what every single good, you know, marketing firm will do, um, especially the pyramid schemes, um, when they're selling you timeshares or anything, they will say, really, really carefully figure out why didn't you buy? Which part of this presentation, you know, um, made you not want to buy? Like you will, they, they will keep asking those questions and yeah, you might piss off the prospect a little bit, but this is data that you really, really want, especially if you're not selling well yet. If you have your 
you know, sales conversation down pretty well, um, and you're a decent salesperson, you will figure this out on your own, but you should at least ask just once, what did I do wrong? Right. Just to, just to get that. Um, but yeah, you got to find your message and, and yeah, hiring copywriters. I don't know. I'm, I, I, I have a lot of friends in the industry, so I'm, you know, I have nothing against what they do. Some of them are great. Um, but it's just hard figuring out who's good. Right. And that's, that's dangerous. So what we will typically do, um, for the clients who don't want to waste their time and want to do this in the paid way, which we do, we have those, we'll just create a couple of variations, right? Well, you know, don't go crazy, you know, like maybe six um, different uh, messages, because if you do too many, you won't figure out what's working, right? And, and they'll be simple, like we'll test two images, um, three pieces of copy, six headlines, and we'll start, we'll start eliminating them, right? So first we'll see which headlines are not working, um, then which pieces of copy, and then we'll kind of go backwards. But this is how that looks. So um, let's say out of the six ads that we set up, only ad one and three converted, right? Which that usually happens, about you know 20% of things will work. Um, and then we'll just see, okay, well, if we look at those two ads, we have one image, which we know that's the image that's gonna work. We have two pieces of copy, we gotta test that and two headlines. Easy to narrow in, right? Then we'll run another test between, um, we'll probably have four variations on this one. We'll do copy one with headline one, copy one with headline three, copy two with headline one, copy two with headline three. Image stays the same because we know that works. And we'll, you know, we'll start testing it. And then at the end, we'll come up with the one that wins. Um, and we just kill off everything that wasn't working. And in this instance, the, this image sucked. So we just killed it off for the client. And we had a couple of variations here. And this was mostly um, headlines uh, in this one. So we had three different headlines which we were still testing. Um, we had the same headline here and here, but this one just didn't work. So that's to find our message. Um, once we do figure that out, and it's only done through testing, you know, this is not... Um, anything that you cannot do, we start figuring out which other platforms that we're not using um, our potential clients might hang out. So this is the next step, which gets missed a lot. And that's who is my perfect client? That's usually my first question to anyone that's not selling well. Describe the perfect client to me. And you know, I'll, I'll often hear something like, Oh, it's a man or a woman working. And I'm like, dude, yeah, that's, that could be anybody. We're talking about perfect clients, right? Like Chris, who would be your perfect client? Cause we know it's a course creator, right? But who is, what's that? What's the rest of that? What did you figure out? Uh, it's a course creator who is, uh, has at least two years of experience with WordPress already is already making at least $30,000 with their expertise that they want to make a course about. And they um, are already some kind of content producer, like, so they're not afraid of the video camera or creating, you know, lots of content. So are you going, and I, I kind of want to put you on the spot. So just that's fine. You know, put me on, put me on the spot. <laughs> just yeah. a little bit, just a little bit. I have, I have so, a second one too, by the way, I just want to throw this out there since you're putting me on the spot. Okay. Uh, also, the people that build these types of high value custom LMS sites for clients is also one of my perfect clients. So it's the, mm. build, it's the builder and the other one that has this perfect mix of experience, monetization, and um, you know, content skills. So I have two, two perfect clients. So that second one kind of leads into my question. So, cause initially I was like, okay, so you have people who are on WordPress, uh, and they're coming in. So that's not very difficult to find, right? You can look for coaches, um, authors, all the people who are on stage, usually, right? Because authors usually write books to get on stage and have nothing to sell, right? So right. move them onto your, your thing. Yeah. But then you have this whole other part of um, people who are on Udemy, on Thinkific, on Teachable, on these platforms, you know, that eventually outgrow them. Yes. And what's Correct. next, 
right? What's next? I call um, that, that, I call that, that's my third avatar. I call them the switchers. So I have starters, switchers, and builders. That's just what I call them. So I have like but, three. But with, with your business, it, you know, I would really start thinking how to help my builders um, market to their people to help get people on my platform, right? Because that's the thing, right? A lot of these builders have this, this thing where like, they want to get people to, you know, to, to come from Thinkific Teachable, I'll build this thing for you, but they just don't know how to do it. Right. Um, or the, they're, maybe they're a WordPress expert, but this is their first like course coaching kind of client or something like that. Yeah. 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 So you, you have a lot of them. So, you know, there's a lot of places where you could look um, to find these guys, you know, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so Facebook, well, you got that. YouTube, definitely. Definitely. You could hijack um, some competitions, videos, and then kind of um, get into that. AdWords, maybe. Maybe Pinterest. I've seen Pinterest work for niches that it shouldn't work for. So I have a hard time with this one. That's the only one I really always look at. Like, I truly don't know. I'll give you an example. I had, I had this guy, um, I mean, amazing course creator. He, um, he's helping people build private practices, right? Which is a very dry kind of subject, you know, therapist, right? Yeah. Um, grew his business to almost a half a million dollars a year now working three days a week. And I'm saying this because I am in awe of what he's doing. Um, and although I helped him with a couple other niches, like his main um, <laughs> traffic generator was Pinterest. And, and, and I asked him why, and he also has no idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And it's just, you know, so sometimes, you know, assumptions also, like you, you got to test them, you know, like a few will, will stick out and a few will like obviously go off, you know, it depends on what you're doing. Like, unless you have something that's very visual, you know, Instagram, it's probably not going to work. And, and I know it's not going to work too, because I have clients coming from Instagram and the platform itself is not working one tenth as well as it did two years ago for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, Twitter also depends on, on on the thing, but you know if you have anything with um, you know eating meat, um, picking up women, or politics, Twitter is going to be your play because that's ninety percent of what happens on there. If you have something really legit, um, it, it takes some research, but maybe I've seen it work. Um, LinkedIn is really good just for B two B. So if you're going to, you know, consumers only, it's not Pinterest. That's a wild card. I don't know. Um, AdWords, uh, it, it depends too. Like if you're going after something super competitive, um, you might also use the platform, but just go maybe on YouTube, right? So the example would be, you know, the, um, I'm going to help you pass um, the series six exam, right? Which uh, it'll be super expensive on AdWords. Um, you might just not, not get your money back, but it's going to be reasonable on YouTube. And then Facebook, it, you know, it really depends too. Um, my problem with Facebook lately is just uh, the cost of ads going up every uh, quarter or so. And I'm seeing it. It's like very visible, you know, like the things that used to cost 70, 75 cents um, in 2015 are like at $7 now. And uh, we're seeing webinar opt-ins and everything go up tremendously. So your offer needs to kind of get more expensive at the end, or it doesn't make sense. With LinkedIn, um, organic outreach only, we've played with our ads. They're like eight to $15 a click. I doubt anyone here has a product that this would make sense for. But we usually start with three or four, you know, just initially, right? And we'll, um, we'll do a little bit of testing. And once again, you're tracking everything that you're doing because otherwise you just, you will know. Um, and you start eliminating just with the ads. Like, okay, this platform didn't work. Take it behind the barn, shoot that thing. This one didn't work, again. And then you, you know, pick your one or two. Maybe it is the Facebook for you, which you started with. Uh, but you might see a lot of potential on YouTube and be like, okay, well, let me figure out Facebook a hundred percent and then we'll move to YouTube for scaling, right? Because you, you don't want to spread yourself thin too, um, unless you have a big budget. Um, and what we've seen, you know, organic can easily take you to six figures, right? So, you know, sometimes when we see people like, Oh, I want to make my first thousand, you, 
at this point, you just need to hustle and probably get your messaging right. Cause that's usually what's, you know, um, stopping you from that. After, you know, you get to six figures, that's, that's going to be a systems thing more than anything. Past seven figures, you know, you're going to hit a lot of ceilings on some of these platforms. So it's going to take a lot of, uh, a lot of different types of strategies to get there. You know, multiple platforms, multiple outreach, probably affiliates, you know, different things. Um, but in the beginning, just the six figures, one platform, one good message and hustle. And then, you know, I, I like to say hustling is overrated once you get past that, because you want to get smarter and <laughs> 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 not work so hard. So this is just an example of um, us tracking this wrecking the shotgun for a client. And for him, um, since it was just one message, we didn't have multiples here. It was very easy. We seen, we did about the same amount of work on each one. Um, LinkedIn had 52 people hit the opt-in page. AdWords had 38 and Facebook had uh, 463 here. So, Easy, you know, we just Facebook, that's what works for you. Um, then LinkedIn, then AdWords. He actually thought AdWords would be much better than LinkedIn, but data said otherwise. So, you know, easy to figure out. But you want to track all of these, you know. Um, oh yeah, always answering the data, reverse engineer the traffic. Um, and any platform not working, just shut it off. You know, and then if you see something that has a lot of potential, just keep that as, you know, your second next to figure out platform, but don't figure out everything at once. Don't do it. Once you get the one platform, you just narrow in and scale. Um, and this, once again, more of an example of paid because it's easier to explain. With organic, it would be more of like, well, it depends. Let me hear about your audience. I can't, you know, come up with this unless I know what you're doing. But uh, with Facebook and Instagram, if it's paid, we'll go remarketing first, then we'll go lookalikes and custom audiences. We see people switch these two around a lot. They'll go after custom audiences first. Um, at this point, Facebook is so smart that if your initial re remarketing audience is good enough, they'll know much better than you can who the best people will be to go into your funnel. So some smart lookalikes. Uh, I would still put constraints on them based on, so I would like let Facebook do their thing, but I would still say, fine, except for these, these, and these things, which I know don't really convert for me, right? So it could be, I know that my target market is people between 28 years old and 38, right? So we got the 10 year thing, and I would still exclude the others because I know this part. Like Facebook can, you know, figure out the demographic, but I know that for me this works, so let's not waste money on it. Because, you know, with Google and Facebook, their whole thing is I want to take as much money from you as possible. My job is to give as little as possible. So I will still put constraints on it. With AdWords, we go specific keywords, then phrases, then broad. Um, I'll explain it just because I've had to do a client, so this is not common sense. Um, specific keywords could be... Um, course creators, right? So anyone who only searches for specifically course creators, not creators of courses, course creators, right? A phrase could be um, people who make online courses, like, or how do, I, how do I make an online course? And only that phrase, that's it, right? Um, when you don't um, go after these, Facebook automatically puts you in broad. And this is what happens. If you wanted to look for course creators and you left broad, you would start getting things like, why do course creators suck, right? Or um, do course creators make mistakes by starting courses? Like you would get, you would start paying for all these nonsense sentences, right? So um, when you do get to broad, <laughs> your main job is gonna be just um, eliminating everything that's nonsense from, from Google, right? But you start with these, um, not much traffic, um, but they'll get the best results. So what I've seen is often you can find um, something by doing some keyword research, which will uh, tell you what key, uh, like um, 
what lead magnet to come up with, right? So I'll give you an example. We had um, in the private uh, practice niche, people were looking for um, private practice checklist. This was like a search that they were already doing. So I told the guy, well, just come up with a lead magnet. That's the private practice checklist. And we're gonna use these specific keywords to get you know, people in the funnel and it worked. You know, it's not rocket science, just made sense. So sometimes when you're having problems and you're even on Facebook or anything else um, with lead magnets, just, you know, start doing some keyword research and you might just see it in front of you. With YouTube, we initially like to um, hijack specific videos, right? So if your competition has a video that's seen a lot and getting a lot of traction, we only want to put ads on their video, that one video uh, to start. Then will be the whole channel, and then at the end, keywords. This is the most um, tricky to get right on YouTube. But we just like to hijack people's stuff. So if someone just um, built up a huge audience on a different course um, platform, WordPress plugin, if I was Chris, I would just go in there and hijack his whole channel. I would have a banner on the side. I would have a banner under every video and in stream in the beginning, like you would see me three times for every time you see him on his own channel. And this was one of those examples of what we thought was working versus what was really working, right? So uh, I'm gonna show you both, um, but we had, you know, cold traffic coming in, we had Instagram messages, old Facebook ads before they implemented the marketing, some retargeting, some organic posts, and based on these, we've seen that, um, that Facebook call traffic and the Facebook retargeted work best, right? But in reality, the other ones didn't do anything, right? Because this was what my client was looking at. Like, okay, this works great, this was great, but in, on Instagram messaging works almost as well as this one. Let's keep putting money into it, right? And they had no sales from that whatsoever. So these two, we kind of seen, but you can still see that, you know, the numbers were not even close to the traffic we were getting, but these two were completely, uh, these two were completely worthless. The old Facebook ads, not doing anything. And the Instagram, even though the numbers seemed like very close, like, oh, we're probably getting sales from it. It was nothing. So we just killed off Instagram completely uh, and just stuck with with the remarketing and the new call traffic. And then we expanded based on that too, to do more. Um, but we would have wasted a lot of money still trying to get this one working. And you never stop testing. Like even though I don't like the hustling mentality, um, you can't ever really step away from this. Um, even an ad that's working great after maybe six or seven months, it'll stop. You know, and you, you will have to have something else on the back burner and you can restart the one that's been working in a year or two from now when people forget. Um, but you, you, gotta, you gotta keep testing. And I'll, I'll share this example with you too, which, um, you know, some people think that their clients like notice everything about them, you know, and, and, but our attention spans are so, so bad that I had the client that had three month email sequence, right? And what we found through a different client was that a lot of people signed up in a similar niche after a year. So this guy's asking me like, well, so should I write up a year and a half email sequence? And I'm like, no, all you do is you take that three email sequence and you rerun it every three months, forever. Forever until the people run off. Um, and the results were the same. And we didn't get one email even after nine months of someone saying like, hey, you sent the same email twice. I mean, so if, um, for the people here, like if you have a longer email sequence and you will get a lot of sa uh, sales a year or two from now from these, if you continue it, just rerun your email sequence. Um, and the reason why the sales come in um, is the same reason why I gave my hats off to Chris in the beginning. People online, are used to everyone coming and going. So a part of building trust, um, and all you need to do to build trust in some instances is someone just seeing you for a year or so. That this person is not going away. 
and now I'll buy from them, right? So it's not your messaging, it's nothing else. It's just that now that trust is there by just being consistently in front of someone. So with emails, my um, strategy for my own business too is to kick people off my emails as quickly as possible because if they don't want to buy this, you know, don't waste my time and money, which I have to pay to convert kit or, you know, whatever other responder you use. And then the other um, scenario, I'm like, well, the other people just don't trust me yet. So I'm going to just keep sending them stuff for years. Um, in my business, it's a little different because it, you know, it moves more. But if you have just a course, those um, touch points and highlights and golden nuggets shouldn't change much because it's, you know, you're selling the same transformation. So you can reuse that sequence over and over and over again. But, you know, those are always differences when you're selling um, a service or a product and then a course. Courses have some unique things to them, which this is one of them. And it's a great one too, because you, you don't have to do that much work. So for email sequences, just rerun them, but not like a week, you know, a week one, <laughs> don't do that right. 52 times. Like it should be about three months. Um, so like my question now would be like, how many emails should I have? Um, in the first 10 days, have 10 emails, then do two emails per week for the rest of those three months and rerun that forever. Um, but obviously don't give the same welcome email in three months. The one's like, hey, thank you for signing up. You know, I'm just, just letting you know this is, yeah. So everything else is okay. So some of the testing that we do, um, this is way past the messaging stage, right? Because that's the most important. Um, we'll play with the colors. We'll play with um, images versus text. Uh, what I found too, lately on Facebook, the color versus black and white has been an interesting one um, because people are just not used to it, right? It breaks people's attention much more. I usually call them the scrolling zombies. It, it just breaks the attention a bit more when they see something they're not used to. It's like, oh, this doesn't look right. Oh, it's black and white. You know, it's <laughs> that type of thing. Um, the focus of people versus product, right? So in this case, it would be more of the transformation versus the person using it, right? So sometimes you will have an image of someone on their laptop. Oh, he's taking my online course where you could have a picture of the end goal, right? So, well, once they learn this, what's the result? Let's get a picture of that. <clears throat> Same thing, problem versus solution. You know, this is, um, a thing you could uh, easily get um, from if you did that one-on-one -on -one sales conversation, right? People are asking like, will it, will it do this? Will it do that? And you put that into the ads and other uh, tests would be just the answers to those questions. Like you will do this, you will get that, you know? So it's just a different way of positioning things. Um, show using product that's more for our um, clients that actually have a combination um, of a course and a product. So this happens a lot in the sports industry. Someone will sell uh, like a, one of those like back rollers, you know, which like to, you know, after your exercises, but it will also sell a course on how to use it, you know? So I found um, people making a lot of money now by creating something that's kind of like a hybrid. You know, something physical and a lot of, um, so another client that I've been working with now is helping um, trainers um, with actual presentations, right? For what they need to teach, which is required by their industry. And right now we're testing what's most important when it comes to the messaging. Do people care more about the online course, which is, you know, like how to teach, what to teach, blah, 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 or the actual materials? which will save a lot of time because the people don't have to come up with these materials now. They just take them and run with it for the next year and a half. So it's like uh, the slideshow in itself is sort of like the product, right? Which we could be showing. And then like how to teach it, what to teach, how to come up with it is the online course. And we, we are testing that right now because we just don't know what's more important to these. You know, the, what does a trainer want more? Um, fonts too, we'll go into that. Um, 
once everything else has been kind of figured out. <clears throat> but the biggest takeaway is just track all this stuff because, you know, I've seen people testing so many things. They'll be like, oh, this button needs to be red, orange. But if you're not tracking, like, how do you know? That's the main thing, right? How do you track your sales, Chris? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not bad, but I'm not great. So I just, I'm using uh, Google Analytics, Facebook Pixel, and you know, Active Campaign, you know, tracking or whatever. But I don't have this awesome like full funnel view that I can make sense of. Like you're, that's one of the reasons why I've got my own like 20 questions for you here because. I okay, I was, just, I was just wondering, because yeah. you're, you're way more advanced than most of the people that say I, you know, have as customers when it comes to this. And that's what I found. Even you, you're probably looking at it like, I kind of know what's happening, because we used to do this for a long time, too, but you don't know. Like, yeah, you not, don't 100%, know. not 100%. Not 100%, yeah, which is, you know, sometimes like, oh, like I wish. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we figured this out. All right, just, I was wondering. But yeah, active campaign. Um, and that's, that's the email aspect of it, right? That's always the hard part. Like, okay, I know people got on these, these emails somehow, yeah. uh, unless you just have one opt-in, then it's simple. But most people don't. You know, there are like 20 different ones. And then at one part of the email sequence will come from all the other email sequences, right? So like we have yeah. like 20 opt-ins and all, yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> what happened? Where did they come from? Right, exactly. Um, and yeah, this is just uh, our service. It's, it's a breakaway from what we do as a company. So we used to offer this only to our clients and now we just, you know, very inexpensively, a little bit above cost, just give it to everyone. And I thought your audience could use it. Um, but yeah, let me, let me get the questions. Um, well, let's start with uh, Deborah there. And before I dive in, awesome presentation, by the way, it's super enlightening. And you, even me as an advanced marketer, um, you know, you, you kind of demystified all the parts. Like, it's really not that hard. You just got to set it up correctly. <laughs> and you got to have these frameworks of these are the dials to turn, which is like super helpful, super helpful. Um, Deborah asks, you. has your therapist client used Pinterest ads? Do they know what kind of, what, what kind of content is getting pinned on Pinterest? So um, it was mostly organic stuff. Um, and they are doing three different things that I've seen because I was trying to figure this out myself. One, a lot of quotes. Two, are you having these type of problems? And then three, the one, the solution, right? Fix this problem by doing X, Y, and Z, right? So they were testing the two, um, yeah, quotes and um, question versus answer, right? So kind of like what you've seen here is the problem versus solution. Right, that was their biggest thing. They were asking the therapists if they have these problems and then telling them they can fix this problem or this is how to fix this problem, right? That was most of it, what I figured out from him. But just the amount of traffic that he was getting from the therapist was, you know, like from Pinterest? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you a question on that. I, I haven't even considered Pinterest because I'm a software company and I thought Pinterest was more for like architecture and fashion and like arts and crafts. But what it's a wild card. Yeah. It's a wild card, Chris. Like, look, man, like I used to think it was only for ladies making like bags and doing makeup okay. and buying clothes. And I was completely wrong. Complete. Like, what does a therapist what is a therapist doing searching for answers for his business on Pinterest? <laughs> Like yeah. that doesn't, so it's a wild card, right? Like it's, um, so what I would do is when I'm looking to uh, rack my shotgun, right? Like to, for the three, four platforms, if you only see, let's say three platforms that make sense for you out of those, you know, a couple mentioned, but you should be kind of testing four, as I said, Pinterest is that wild one. Which yeah. is like, you know, if I can't, if I know these three work, those others don't, and which one should I kind of try? try Pinterest. That's what I feel like now. It's just a wild card. You're either going to hit the lottery or miss, which is fine, which is fine. Deborah says that last she checked, Pinterest audience is 75% affluent women. It makes sense to me that he's getting clients there. Well, so. yeah, now it does too once I start <laughs> doing research, but that's, that's the assumption, right? And I'm not always right. Like yeah. I, I look at things and I'm like, okay, well, 
I think differently now based on what I've seen, you know, and this is, this is going to happen with you too. Um, and this is why I said hiring copywriters is so dangerous because a lot of them have big egos and assumptions and they don't want to change them and they don't yeah. know your business. Right. And that's what scares me with them. Um, Deborah has another question and this was related to one of your funnelitic slides. So um, in your tracking, the one message client visual you showed Facebook had the most clicks 463, but the pool was 1,169, 40% of the total. Yet LinkedIn and ads were both hundred percent, although the pool was much lower at 38 and 50 or something. I think what insight does that give you as to the better ROI? I'm not sure if you got the question there, but that's what she was asking. Yeah, yeah. So in this instance, all we were looking at initially was um, which group uh, is actually clicking on and seeing that opt-in page, right? I just wanted to just quickly show the assumption versus what, right? What we would do um, is we would reverse engineer this from the thank you page again. Um, and see which channel actually brought us the people we want after we, you know, we figured out the first step, you know, instead of throwing money into these four, we're going to throw it into two. And the next step would be, we would go one step further, you know, once we had enough people and just see um, which ones are actually signing up and again, eliminate what doesn't work. Um, so that image doesn't show the whole picture, right? The insight was only, okay, we are wasting money on a couple pieces here. Um, but from the one, oh, okay, with the one with the LinkedIn, yeah, we would go one step further too. You know, we would reverse engineer and see who's actually bringing the money in. Because we're seeing three channels are working. Um, one's working better than the other one. You know, LinkedIn was actually better than I think the Facebook one. So Facebook is maybe out, but we, we're going to again see um, who's making, who's actually bringing the sales in. So Funalytics could be its own um, webinar. I just kind of wanted to show some examples of, you know, the, the, problems that we encounter and like assumptions. Um, but you could, yeah, definitely get the data you need um, if you had that funnel in front of you. Let me ask you a question. One of the things that slows me down as a marketer who wants to b do more tracking is always having to create unique links, especially when it comes to something like social media or whatever. Is there an easier way than going to Google UTM link generator? Yeah, so, so yeah, Funnelytics helps you do that. So. Um, if you have a property, um, you can actually have create 10 Facebook ads going towards that. And you would just label them, um, let's say like a lead magnet one, lead magnet two, lead magnet three, right? And it will give you those links, which you just throw in. So it's like all done within the platform and you just copy and paste. So it's, so it's more very efficient. quick. It's, it's just quickly because it's already, first you visually set it up really quickly, then copy the links and then tracking is already set up. Like, the software takes care of the rest of that. Where with Google Analytics, like those other things, you would have to set them up on an external website and we have to put them in somewhere else and then you will not really see it. So it takes at least two steps out from that work. So it's super easy and it's drag and drop. And just, you know, you label it really quickly, like just LM1 or, you know, whatever you want to, and it'll give you that link. It's, it's really cool. So the second you attach a Facebook ad to a property, it already takes that domain link and it will just add whatever you put in at the end of it and you just copy paste, right? So it's, I wish I could show it here, but it's super easy. That's cool. And how could, should people think about <clears throat> conversion to an opt-in like a lead magnet or webinar registration versus getting the sale? Because I think I see some people, especially beginners, super focused on the sale, but there's also these other kinds of conversion points. And, and this is why, you know, with this client, I told him, since we don't have a um, big budget, big, you know, data to play with, like, I, I, I get what you want to do, um, but we need to figure out if the steps before are working properly first. So initially was, you know, um, let's see how many people are seeing the sales page or the opt-in page, right? And, you know, instead of, throwing money into the next ones, we quickly eliminated Instagram. So we just saved some cash before the next test continues, right? Once we've done that, now we have only two channels, which was Facebook remarketing, Facebook cold. And now we're going to use only those two and figure out how many people opted in. Not just seeing the sales page, but opted in. 
and we're going to eliminate more based on that. Once we eliminate more than that, we're going to see, okay, now we want to see how many people opted in and click on our email, which actually showed them the sales page we want them to see. Done. Eliminate again. And then we want to see how many people done all that and actually bought the product. So even though we might sell the products from the beginning, all that's going to do is build up more data for us, but we will actually focus on that until we kind of go step by step and, you know, figure out what's broken in the beginning. So an example of that um, in a factory would be, let's say, I don't know if a lot of people know what a bottleneck is, but that's the thing that stops um, whatever, you know, from happening. So, that, so like if someone's making, let's say pencils and the machine can only make so many of the metal parts for the um, eraser, you know, things would stop at the bottleneck, right? At that piece. And this would be with that. So quality control. Some companies will put the quality control after the metal gets made. And now they're making a lot of bad pencils and waiting for that to happen. This is what would happen if you just went for the sales. And then some put the quality control before the bottleneck. So they know since this machine is only making so many of the uh, metal parts, um, we will do quality control before and make sure that all the pencils who are broken before this don't go through the machine. So we don't waste even more time and money, right? So that's something we've taken from uh, an idea we took from huge factories. And that's what they do. This is quality control before we move on, you know, and, and each one of these is a bottleneck for us until we move past it. That is awesome. That's super cool. Um, Tim asks, he sees people starting specific Facebook groups first to create pre buzz for their course. Do you recommend that and track that too, coming from tribe building efforts before cold marketing? I think that's a better question for Chris. How would you recommend for someone to build a Facebook group? Because, you know, my opinion it varies on this, but it's a lot of work. It's not your platform. I don't know. Chris, what do you think? I think, uh, I mean, building community is, it's more than just building an email list. And if you're willing to do the work, I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, I have so, like a 7,000 person Facebook group. I like to say it was like five years of daily work to overnight success. And, and that's, <laughs> it was uh, the fir up to the first 400 people. It wasn't really that engaged. It was a lot of work just to get people to get it to take on a life of its own. But if you're willing to commit to it and keep the quality high and kick people out all the time and all that stuff, like, yeah, do it. And, and that's the challenge um, that people run into. And I, I, you know, I'll have someone saying like, you know, Tom, I started a Facebook group to help my efforts and I'm not hearing anything. I'm hearing crickets. Well, like Chris said, you will continue hearing crickets for <laughs> quite a bit of time before it takes off. So it, it is a snowball effect, but it takes a long hustle and work to build it up to that snowball, right? So, and with me, and that's why I threw it in, I'm very big on control. Um, and, you know, I've learned through many of my other businesses that, you know, if someone else controls your business, you don't really have one at some point. So anything controlled by Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, up like that's the only thing you have and you've built, you, you know, the, the foundation is not very solid. You know, it's, it's great until it works, but the day it doesn't anymore or it's taken away from you, it's not. So I would proceed with caution. Yes, those are good points. Um, about YouTube, the, uh, I, I know you can put like ads beside and, and stuff, but like that main pre, isn't the biggest opportunity that main pre first five seconds in front of a video? Is that, or is it, am, am I making an assumption there? That's an assumption. Um, the ones that we've seen work best um, are either the few seconds before or the banner on the right hand side. And that's a banner, not like a promoted thumbnail kind of thing. I'd, I'd have to look at it to see. Is it? So I think it's a 250 by 250. It's the same type of ad that you would throw on Google AdSense. Okay. Um, and it's on the right hand side above the suggested videos. Okay. Gotcha. So usually what you want to do is if you really like someone's video, you want to hijack all of those. Um, and basically to hijack all of those, you need to give YouTube all three dimensions. So you would give them the dimension of the banner below, 
the one on the side and the video to go in, in front. And YouTube will then see, okay, I've got all of those. I want to put all of those on there. That's it. There's like no way to actually do it otherwise. And what, like from a messaging standpoint, do, in, in some examples you've seen, do people do really right in that first five seconds? Because I know when I watch YouTube, I can't wait to click the skip ad button usually. But sometimes usually, I'll, yeah. I'll hear something and I'll be like, all right, that's interesting. I'll give you 15 more seconds. And then like, if it's good, maybe they got me. I don't know. But how do you, how do you make something compelling in such a short amount of time? It's usually by, um, and it's, it's again, it's the interrupting the scrolling zombies, except with YouTube, it's the interrupting the, you know, the watching zombies. So yeah. you, you need to have um, a question or a statement made that's a bit unusual, right? Um, so like controversial or like make people mm -hmm. like, hey, wake up, think, like I have a question for you. Have you ever, whatever. Yeah, so, so the cheap version of this, um, and, and anyone who's been to a bookstore or the airport seen this, um, is all these authors now trying to be cool and controversial by putting fuck with those two little things in their book. You, you've seen that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how to stop this, how to stop effing this, how to stop that. <laughs> and at yeah. the end, it's like, seriously, like I went, I seen, you know, in the top 10, three books with that nonsense in there. But that's the cheap, crappy way, which someone converted to YouTube recently because I was stuck with an ad like, do you like fucking your clients? And I was like, I mean, cool, you know, a bit unusual, um, but it's a cheap way of doing it, right? So yeah. do that, just don't be cheap, you know, by just using a word that's like, you know, okay, it's, it's okay for a while, then it gets played out. But it's the same type of idea. It'll stop you in your tracks when it's the first time you're seeing it. Yeah. Right? And that's what you want to do on YouTube. That makes sense. What, um, you mentioned the, uh, you said the phrase, a good use of the limited budget. If somebody's just get, get, getting going on paid and let's say they're pretty validated on the organic and they've got, you know, conversions happening in their network and their cold on their just SEO traffic. What, where, what is um, a good use of a limited budget? And what is, should you consider a starting budget amount per month to invest on paid traffic? Well, so if someone's got the messaging right, because they've pre-validated, so we're kind of, you know, we're assuming this. Um, but maybe on Facebook, you know, they really want to um, start getting their um, groundwork done before, you know, they can move on. Then, you know, you have your messaging, but then like, okay, is it the whole messaging or do you just have your headline? You have your copy. So we would just do small tests of, you know, will people react better to an image or a video? And... Are Which these like line? are these like fifty dollar tests or hundred dollar? I would do. I usually do like twenty twenty thirty dollars per day. Um, but what you want to do is make sure they run a couple weekdays and over the weekend, because people are different and they react differently to things. Um, you know whether they're working or not. So maybe do like a Thursday until Monday test, or Friday until Tuesday. Right. So you're hitting kind of both the end of the week, the weekend, some of the weekdays, like, you know, just, just to get a better idea and try hitting around a thousand impressions. Um, Cause then you kind of, okay, a thousand people have seen this. That's usually enough to know, like, you know, sort of what's happening with it. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Um, can you tell us what people get at we track your marketing.com. We got a link to that in the chat in the chat. What, uh, what's over there? What's a, what's in the offer? So, so initially we had only one offer. Um, when I tested this in November at a conference and I sold a lot of them because we were basically offering access to funnelytics, which is the, the pro folder where we can do everything that we talked about for like, I think it's like 97 bucks. And you know, normally it's like a 15, $1, 1600 uh, yearly. So one time fee, boom, you get it. We, we hook you up with that. Um, the second one we had is where we help you set up the first initial properties. Um, because we found some people saying, can you at least get me started? Um, you know, because we just don't, you know, and if, you know, you need us to get more um, of your team in there, blah, 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 like we put that in there. And the last one, which is we, we don't really like selling because it's a lot of work. Uh, but we've been asked lately is can you do it all for us? 
I have click funnels and 20 emails and all this stuff. And I just want you to set up everything. So we said, yes. Um, and it's still up, but we're still wondering whether we want to continue doing that. So it's three different ones. The middle one has been the best seller. Um, the, the first one just gives you the access. The two is access with a little bit of help. That's the gold. And then one is do it all for people who want us to do it all. Um, but yeah, it, became, it kind of came out organically. We're still not 100% set on this. Um, the prices are still very low because we're testing um, just what people want from us more than they don't. At the end, I would like just having two products. We'll probably take that um, hold on for you away. And um, the first one's gonna be still the simple one, probably at a little higher cost because Funalytics is going up every year. Um, and the second one, hopefully, will be the exactly dialed in what 80% of our market just wants. Um, and it's the simplest for us. So we are still testing too. That's why you see, you know, it's prices are low and it's like a couple of different offers on it. Um, but with the stuff we're selling, you can already do anything we showed you on the, in the presentation. And this is what we set up for our clients too. So you have, you know, you have the exact same tools um, if you spent three, $4,000 with us for the actual marketing. So it's just a breakaway, a small piece, which I think everyone should have. Um, and, and that's why we broke it away. It was more of like, mm, it's gonna be more work for us to set up this other piece of business, but I feel like every single person should be tracking. Like you're gonna lose so much money if you don't. <laughs> that, was, that was my thinking behind it. Well, um, and we're gonna draw our giveaway winner here in a sec. Um, one final question, like <clears throat> I spent a lot of time just helping people like do best practices, especially in the beginning. And one of those is like, just, it's the very beginning of your project, day one, install Google Analytics. There's a plug -in. there's some WordPress plugins that make that super easy. Just like have a tracking mindset. Let's just, even if you don't need it right now, you're gonna need it later. How does somebody go from beginner tracker to like, all right, let's get serious. Kind of like in your world, like what's the best way to like level up? So when you start trying to test your messaging, that already means you, you are moving up foundationally and that's where the better tracking should come in. Initially, when you're just putting nonsense out there in the world and hoping someone buys and, you know, testing, you just like, okay, I got my sales page up, you know, there's no need for good tracking yet. Like you're still getting your kind of feet wet, you know, on the ground. But the moment you actually start thinking like, you know what, I'm going to do my first test and I want to see results from it. Well, then you do need to start testing. Now, if you are only doing, um, I'm testing whether people go straight to my sales page and buy from me all within WordPress, analytics is okay for that. But the moment you introduce, I'm gonna test lead magnets and emails, then analytics kind of, or something like it, which we haven't found yet, um, will we'll have to play a role for you to get a big picture. Because with analytics, you'll only see a bit of the end result. I've seen people come to my lead magnet, I've seen them disappear, and I've seen some people appear on my sales page, and I kind of know what's happening, but I don't really, you know, it's not a test anymore. Um, so that's when you've moved on and you need something bigger. Because even if you look at active campaign, um, your best really bet is like, well, I can see um, that this headline is working and this one's not, and I can test those by switching them off and seeing if the you know click through rate goes up. But it doesn't tell me is this actually leading to a sale? And you know if I have multiple lead magnets, and I'm a little more advanced now, and let's say, like this is what usually happens: um, people will test. 16, 17 lead magnets, because you know, like you need to test a lot of them to make it work. And the first email will always be the same, kind of like, you know, thank you for getting this lead magnet, blah, blah, blah. But then they all get thrown into that sequence, right? Mm -hmm. So now I don't know even which lead point. magnet they came from, the entry point that made that sale. So I'm completely blind. And that's when you really need this type of service. Well, that's again in the beginning if you've only made the sales page um, or only one lead magnet without emails, I guess, or with just one sequence, um, maybe you can still play with an analytics. Like that beginning stage 
you're fine, you know, um, and, and, and it's completely okay. We all start with that. It's fine. Just when you want to start really getting, you know, moving on as a business person, you need to track. That's awesome. That's super helpful way to think about it. When you have multiple paths, when, um, you know, emails getting involved, multiple sequences, and you want to test uh, headlines and your assumptions across the copy and stuff like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but, but from day one, even when you're using analytics, get heat maps, hot jar, three for the first three, at least see even from day one how people are interacting with your sales page. At least get something, get some kind of a visual. Analytics gives, doesn't give you that, and this is free. You know, it's, it's, it's like a day one thing also. You should put a heat map on any sales page you're showing to the world so you get some kind of feedback on it. Otherwise, you're going to be kind of working blind again. And, you know, you hire a graphic designer and he says, oh, we should change all this stuff around. And it's like, really? Based on what? Yeah. You know? So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I like hiring people, but I also like to kind of make their, you know, make stuff make sense, right? It's like, well, yeah, I, I like what you're doing here, but why are you using it? Use the heat map. You can see where people are dropping off, where people are not clicking, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, work with something. <laughs> we got a, a question from Deborah in the audience. She's asking you to give an example of five properties, your $97 offer. If she's using all three, if she's using all three domains, she's struggling with the quote properties concept. Uh, okay, so if I go back, um, Well, on these, we really don't have it. Okay, so properties. Uh, you have three domains, that's three different properties. Um, let's say you had a webinar, that could be the fourth one, and you could have... So beyond the website. Beyond the website, yeah. So, so within a website, you can use this for as many pages as you want. But I'll, I'll give you an example of one I had recently. Um, they were using WordPress for the lead magnets. Then they were using click funnels for the checkout process. Um, actually, no, so it was lead magnet, WordPress, webinar, webinar software, click funnels for the entire upsells and checkout process. Um, Thrive Cart for the actual payment piece of it, and then Teachable for the platform. It was the most messed up thing I've seen. And that was, I think, six or seven platforms then. I call that a software Frankenstein. It, it was, it was uh, when I seen it, I was looking at it. And I'm like, why, what, what made you, you know, but um, that's the worst one I've seen. So five properties usually covers any normal marketing effort. Is a, uh, is like active campaign or convert kit or would that be a property like your, it is, it is not, it is not, it is not emails okay. um, are tracked by um, the links that people click. So the way Funnelytics um, sees uh, another responder is they have something called ghost lines, right? Um, so you will create a ghost line from your thank you page on whatever, let's say the lead magnet going running through all of your email sequence. And Funnelytics sees that any person anywhere in that sequence, if they click on a link, they came from the thank you page initially. Oh, nice. So it tracks that, right? So it's, it's, it's not actually a property, but it's they kind of ghost track people. They know where this person came from. Um, so no, it is not a property, and, but yes, they do track it. And that's how it goes out through time, not just like one session. Like even if it's many, many days or months into yes. the email sequence, that ghost line is tracking the yes. original source. And, and, and that's why it's so useful because, for example, you could have had someone sign up today. They put that email away in their process or whatever folder in Gmail. Um, go back to it seven months from now make a sale while you're running a whole different campaign. But, you know, finally, it's still through the ghost line scene, like, yeah, but.
Kathy, did he freeze or did I freeze? Um, I think he did. Okay, I thought I was. I'm not sure. I was trying to figure that out. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, hopefully Tom will come back. Uh, we were just getting ready to say goodbye. While he's gone, um, do you want to draw the winner, Kathy, and see who we got for the $99 Lift Your Illness giveaway? We've got Carrie King. You were the uh, winner of the $99 year. Hit us up at team at liftrlms.com and we'll hook you up with your winnings. Tom is back. Yeah, my um, one of my internet uh, connections just went out, but I'm back now. It's all good, it's all good. Um, we were just drawing the giveaway winner. Tom is from wetrackyourmarketing.com. There's a link to that in the chat. Go ahead and grab that. Um, you're getting a lot of uh, Thank yous in the comments. I thought that was an awesome presentation, man. It was uh, it's super helpful, and I appreciate the, you know, all the tips and tricks. I'm t I'm walking away with a lot of value and new ideas. I gotta figure out and get into action and level up on the tracking front. So thanks for coming on here. Any final words for the people? Um, just you know, good luck with your stuff. Be persistent. That's all I can say. You know, half of the battle is really persistency. You know, and and, and that's the thing with gaining trust from your customers. You just have to be in front of them for long enough. Um, and yeah, thanks for letting me on. Like I, I thought, well, Chris brought me on again, you know, although I asked, uh, I got to give even more value this time. So it's been hopefully, like a year. It's been like a yeah, year. Yeah, but you know, I, I still, um, I don't know, time flies really quick for me because I'm always into something. Um, yeah. But I feel like, you know, if I come back again, maybe next year, I want to bring even more. So like, that's just <laughs> 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 well, that's awesome. Well, thanks. You did a great job. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Kathy, for helping me put it on. And I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Take care. Awesome.